Distinguished guest speakers, dear participants from all over the world, more than 100 countries are represented today for this webinar. On behalf of Stefan Flanders' board and of SDSN Belgium, welcome. I sincerely hope you, your family and colleagues are all healthy and safe in this challenging time of Corona. It is my pleasure and honor to open this international webinar to discuss the alignment of the European Recovery Plan and the European semester with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. Key question of this webinar is, how SDG proof is the EU recovery plan? And what is the position of the Belgian federal government? My name is Peter Wollaert. I am fellow of the United Nations Institute of Training and Research, UNITAR in Geneva, and managing director of CIFAL Flanders. CIFA Flanders is a UNITAR affiliated training center on peace, human rights, and sustainable development, with a focus on the implementation of the Agenda 2030. CIFA Flanders was created in 2013 and is based in Antwerp, a port and diamond city in Flanders, Belgium. CIFA Flanders is one of the 20 international training centers of the CIFA Global Network. And so a special welcome to all our colleagues from UNITAR and of the CIFA Global Network. CIFA Flanders is a foundation of public utility and supported by more than 25 partners. It's a multi-actor network of authorities, companies, institutions, and civil society organizations. This network of partners is our SDG learning network. They are the front runners in capacity building and implementation of the SDGs. CIFA Flanders is also a funding member of the SDSN Belgium network. The Sustainable Development Solutions Network was established in 2012 by Professor Jeffrey Sachs as a global network for sustainable development and operations under the auspicious of the United Nations. SDSN Belgium was founded in 2018 and it is an independent network of educational institutions research centers, businesses, and knowledge institutions. The mission of SDSN Belgium is to mobilize Belgian scientific and technological expertise and strengthen capacity to promote practical solutions for sustainable development. The concept of this webinar. The SDSN Belgium members here you can see on the screen at the moment, and we are very honored to be part of this network of expertise. The concept of this webinar, this is the program. Um, I really like to um, introduce to you Mr. Nikhil Set, who is the UN Assistant Secretary General and executive director of UNITAR. And after his introductional speech, we will have an introduction on uh, SDSN, on the European semester and recovery plan, on Belgium's recovery plans, followed by a panel discussion and some closing remarks. I really like to give the floor to Mr. Nikhil Set, UN Assistant Secretary General and Executive Director of UNITAR. Mr. Set, the floor is yours. Thank you, Peter, the Director of UNITAR's 
CIFAL Center and to the UN SDSN Belgium. Thank you very much. And I want to welcome also all the participants to the webinar today. When I look back, those were heady days in 2015, when in September that year, the world signed on to the SDGs with the promise of ending poverty, of reducing inequality, promoting peaceful and just societies, and putting our fragile planet on a sustainable trajectory. But realizing this agenda called for a complete transformation in our political, economic, and financial systems with policies oriented first to the most vulnerable in our societies, with vulnerability being de defined by income, by gender, by age, by remoteness, by disability, by indigenous issues, and so on. But this was not happening and is not happening. Even before the COVID-19 pandemic, the world was not on track and progress on the SDGs was uneven. Yes, it's true that more children were in school. Yes, there was improvement in the drinking water situation. And there was an increase in the participation of women in leadership roles. But hunger was on the rise and our natural environment was declining very rapidly. Inequality was rising in all regions. The scale of change and the transformations that were needed to get to the SDGs by 2030 was not happening. The post-COVID scenario has shaken the 2030 agenda to its very core. The pandemic disrupted even the mild successes that we saw in the earlier period and in fact has pushed back progress globally by several decades. While the hurdles in our paths are truly daunting and the ambitious 2030 agenda may look even more unattainable, this is not the time to fret or to wring our hands in despair. We need to continue to focus on growth with inclusion, equity and sustainability. The COVID crisis has been universal in its impact and it has exposed once again the fault lines of our unequal world and societies. Over 71 million, according to the World Bank, have been pushed back into extreme poverty. 1.6 billion people in the informal economy have been severely affected. Over 1 billion slum dwellers are increasingly vulnerable. Older people, the disabled, migrants and refugees, school children, women are among those who have been very hard hit. Healthcare is disrupted everywhere. Mental health issues, domestic abuse, school closures, and greater violations of human rights dominate our news feeds. The life altering consequences of COVID 19 will reshape our societies everywhere forever. The economic impacts of the crisis have been dramatic. We are in the worst recession in generations. Trade is plunging dramatically. Remittances of migrant workers has falling and it fell over 20% last year. Foreign direct investment will decline by 40%. In this darkness, the framework and principles which were created in 2015 the SDGs are key to building back better and to prepare us to face an even larger looming crisis, the climate change emergency that we face. If I were to put all this crisis that we face, economic, social, environmental, and the, especially the one on climate change, and I was to translate them into some sort of simple transitions, I would say that the five transitions the world needs now are the following. First, transition in health system driven by universal health care. Second is a transition in our energy systems driven by accessibility, renewables and efficiency. Third is transition in our agricultural systems 
driven by ending hunger and sustainability in our increasingly water scarce world. Fourthly, transition in our educational systems driven by the power of new technologies and the power they have in democratizing learning and education. And finally, transitions in our urban settlements driven by sustainability and a greater focus on the circular economy. I also strongly believe that the technology and its applications will drive each of these transitions. These transitions are underway in many parts of Europe and Europe has always set a very high standard for the rest of the world to emulate and must be also inclusive in its aid efforts looking at these transitions. I wish to congratulate the EU leaders for paving the way out of the current public health crisis. It's not gone, but yes, a path is clearly there and laying the foundations of recovery and for a more sustainable Europe through the EU recovery plan and the Green Deal initiative. This large stimulus package will not only help rebuild a post COVID Europe, but will also provide a platform to build back better, aligning the European recovery with the SDGs, with a greener, more digital and more resilient region. I see from the SDSN dashboard that all 10 countries closest to achieving the SDGs are in Europe, as are 17 of the 20 top countries. Sweden, Denmark, Finland, France, Germany, Norway, Austria, Czech Republic, Netherlands, Estonia, Belgium, Slovenia, UK, Ireland, Switzerland. They have done made a, and Croatia. There's a remarkable performance in an international perspective. Three Nordic countries topped the 2020 SDG index, Sweden, Denmark, and Finland. Belgium is ranked in 11th position in the world, but even the best in class are not on track to fully achieve the SDGs by 2030. The SDGs provide the ideal framework to guide immediate post-crisis recovery and long-term strategies toward more resilient societies. This magic phrase, building back better under a post-COVID-19 economic recovery and for financing within Europe and globally. It is crucial that the investment-led recovery supports a sustainable, inclusive and re resilient recovery from COVID-19 based on the European Green Deal, addressing each of the 17 SDGs. These are indivisible and needs to be equally addressed. More than stimulus packages that boost aggregate demand, the crisis calls for a recovery driven by transformative public investments that support green infrastructure, digitization and technological advances and responsible consumption and production. The concept of the circular economy has caught the imagination on Europe and that must continue to be the bedrock of economic, social, environmental policies. Policy integration will be crucial in the decade of action. We can only reach higher levels of sustainable development by aligning policy plans with long-term goals. The SDGs provide a framework for long-term goals and should be integrated into all policy fields in order to achieve them. We applaud the European Commission's efforts in integrating the SDGs in the European semester and urge all member states to harmonize their recovery plans with Agenda 2030. The European recovery plans provide a historic opportunity to invest in the future as well. Agenda 2030 provides a framework for this future and should form the foundation of the recovery plans. Integration of policy was a central principle for the SDG framework, and we spent a lot of time on this concept as we were conceptualizing and writing uh, Agenda 2030 and the SDGs. An integration which would account for the several interfaces between peace and justice and environment and economic and social policies, which are all closely enmeshed. What does this integration mean? It means that policies which are intelligent, whether at the regional level or the national level or the institutional level, must do a significant rethink of cost benefits 
and what are co benefits we can't dollarize all the benefits and costs often and it's only by looking at this analysis afresh that we can define better and more sensible policies to reach the five transitions that i mentioned in public health in energy in agriculture in education for sustainable cities as also prioritizing the interests and concerns of the most vulnerable let me close by once again expressing my gratitude to our training center in antwerp and its capable director on the screen peter wallat for organizing this timely dialogue and to the sustainable development solutions network belgium for its various efforts including in advocacy in support of the sdgs i look forward to today's discussions and presentations by the european commission sharing of the belgian experience and of course for jeffrey sachs own comments i thank you very much peter thank you very much uh, nikil we're going to continue um, through the agenda Nikhil, I think you've made uh, phenomenal uh, points, really insightful about how indeed the world is not on track uh, in meeting the SDGs. Furthermore, many of the terrible ails of last year that we all consider to have been an awful year are in fact the consequence of the unsustainable trajectory that we were at. Um, Indeed, the pandemic itself can be traced uh, to the degradation of uh, our ecosystems. If, um, if we zoom in on Europe, um, as you were saying, Nikhil, um, are not just the, the, the sustainable development uh, report, but our, specifically our European sustainable development report that we published a couple of months ago shows that even before the onset of the pandemic, no country was on track to achieve the SDGs. And while Europe indeed uh, performs relatively well, uh, relatively well um, compared with the rest of the world, there are a number of SDGs where the region is performing poorly. One of these is SDG 2, uh, and this is due to our unsustainable uh, agricultural practices and our unsustainable diets, as well as increasing levels of obesity. A country like Belgium, so if we zoom even further, that as uh, it has just been mentioned ranks 11th uh, in the global index, has a very solid performance in a number of SDGs, including, for example, SDG 8 or SDG 9 on decent work uh, and, uh, and industry, innovation and infrastructure. However, it still has, uh, and, and here, once again, we're talking pre-pandemic, it had uh, serious gaps of performance in goals such as SDG 13 on climate action or SDG 12 on sustainable consumption and production. So, in summary, indeed, we are in an unsustainable trajectory. We've seen last year the consequences of this trajectory. And um, the SDGs continue to be the only, the only framework that we had. Nikhil has explained in quite a bit of detail what uh, what it meant to reach that agreement. It was a highly participatory and exciting uh, process. So this is the framework that we have. And in fact, in the midst of so much um, difficulties that we're going through, it's also a framework of hope. It's a roadmap to a sustainable future. One that uh, puts well-being at the center one that takes us to sustainable cities with decent jobs, with shared prosperity and healthy diets, and one where we can guarantee that our children will be enjoying the ecosystems that we have. This is why at SDSN we are very pleased that the European Union is not compromising its vision of a green, inclusive and prosperous Europe in the face of the pandemic. And it's also why we think that it's particularly crucial 
to think through rigorous plans that can change the trajectory we're at. And, that, and to do these as a way out of this crisis. Um, Europe has launched a number of uh, facilities and programs to achieve this. We have indeed the European Green Deal, which is tremendously ambitious and comprehensive. We have the objective of aligning the SDGs, the, the semester process with the SDGs, which would change our model of growth and the way we coordinate SDG-wide policies. And we also have the Recovery and Resilience Facility. We are very excited that in today's workshop, we're going to be hearing from the European Commission about how these different uh, programs connect to each other. And with this in place, we think that meeting the SDGs will be uh, a matter of strong political leadership and ambitious policies. So we're also very keen on hearing from the federal government of Belgium about how they're thinking through the operationalization of all of these uh, strategies. This is precisely what SDSN is focused on anchoring the SDGs, localizing and thinking through what do these mean for a specific country and what are the concrete pathways for implementation. Because of the level of ambition in Europe and because of the level of uh, urgency that we have, we have recently launched um, an umbrella network, the SDSN Europe, that is going to be coordinating the work of all of our national and regional networks in Europe, including, of course, SDSN Belgium, as well as the work of our over 350 institutional members from across the continent. This network is going to help us streamline our research uh, connected to European policies. And it's going to help us create spaces for discussion, for debate, for co-creation of solutions and for sharing knowledge. We are very humble and very aware that the, the challenge ahead is, is phenomenal. We do need to think through about how to implement these goals. Indeed, uh, SDSN has also put forward uh, a six transformation framework that is um, almost identical to the one that Nikhil uh, presented. These, are, these frameworks facilitate um, the way we think about the goals and also help governments think through what ministries need to be involved, what kind of expertise we need, what kind of um, financial flows are necessary. So this is what SDSN is going to be focusing on in, uh, in Europe. Um, and we hope that this webinar today will be the first of a series of webinars happening around the continent led by our different networks. Um, and because we've recently launched this European effort, we are very keen to hear from everyone participating in today's calls. If you want to get involved, please reach out to us. If you have a specific expertise, if you want to think through these uh, questions in your own country. Without uh, further ado, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, uh, Birli Nutz. She, is, uh, she works for the representation of the European Commission in Belgium as European Semester Officer, and is also a member of the Recover Task Force at the European Commission. She's in charge of coordinating and implementing the Recovery and Resilience Facility. Previously, she was a state aid case handler at DG Competition, and she holds a Master of Laws from the Catholic University of Leuven and from the University of Chicago. Birli, we're very keen to hear your thoughts about how indeed are the semester process and the recovery and resilience facility going to be linked and what are some of the key um, components that countries need to take into consideration when developing their recovery and resilience uh, plans? Over to you, Nikhil. Oh, sorry, Birli. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you so much also from my side for uh, the organization of this event, which could not be more timely. As you may know, the European Parliament uh, will vote tomorrow uh, on the recovery and resilience facility, uh, which uh, I will be talking about today. 
sustainable development is enshrined as a core principle in the Treaty on European Union. Last November, as most of you know, the Commission set out its comprehensive approach to delivering on the SDGs. Each of the 17 SDGs features in one or more of the six headline ambitions of the von der Leyen Commission. SDGs are implemented in a holistic way using a whole of government approach with every commissioner ensuring the delivery within their policy area. And important to underline, Eurostat monitors progress towards the SDGs, both at an EU and member state level. And you can see the key strands of this approach on this slide. And I will focus on two strands today, embedding sustainability in the European semester of economic governance and using the SDGs to guide the objectives of the recovery instrument next generation EU. So what is the European semester? Well, it is the annual coordination cycle of economic, employment and social policies with specific monitoring also of member states' fiscal policies and broader macroeconomic policies. And ever since its introduction, the European semester has evolved with the new political uh, priorities. It's a highly dynamic and a highly agile tool. The social dimension, for example, has been gradually increased with the implementation of the European pillar of social rights now as being one of the key objectives. Importantly, the Commission monitors the implementation of SDGs in the semester since the 2020 cycle. And as I will explain today, the semester has a prominent role in the EU recovery plan. And this shows the relevance of the European semester is undisputed. It has the attention of the highest political level across member states. In Belgium, for example, there is a lot of consensus on our analysis, on our recommendations. And why is this? Well, because the Commission does not work in isolation. We have a permanent and very rich dialogue with stakeholders ranging from Parliament, governments, administration, social partners, businesses, academia, and civil society. The cycle is kick-started with the definition of the political priorities of the Union in the so-called annual sustainable growth strategy. Mark the word sustainable. The country reports provide a picture of the socioeconomic situation of each member state, the progress they made, and the key remaining challenges. And in turn, member states submit their national reform programs to the Commission. The Commission then proposes recommendations, which are discussed and endorsed by the Council. It is mainly the green dimension that was reinforced in the semester pre-corona crisis, with the Green Deal as the new European economic growth strategy to create an economy that works for people and the planet. And in particular to achieve carbon neutrality in 2050 with a just transition for all. And as you can see on this slide, this strategy has four interrelated dimensions with competitive sustainability as the guiding principle of the European social market economy. And these four dimensions are green transition, digital transition and productivity, macroeconomic stability and fairness. The 2020 and 2021 annual sustainable growth strategy clearly highlighted how this economic agenda delivered via the semester ensures progress on all SDG dimensions. How? by delivery on structural reforms, investment, and fiscal policies. And this is what you see on this slide. I have tried to match each of the four dimensions with each SDG. The Recovery and Resilience Facility is at the very heart of the biggest financial support program ever financed through the EU budget, Next Generation EU, with a total package of 1.8 trillion euros. 
And the instrument is founded on borrowing for spending. It will provide massive support for investments and reforms to allow Europe to emerge stronger from the current crisis in those crucial first years of the recovery, with grants worth 312.5 billion and 360 billion in loans. And support is available to all member states with a focus on countries hardest hit by the crisis. 5.9 billion in current prices is earmarked for Belgium in grants alone. And to benefit, member states must submit recovery and resilience plans, setting out their national reform and public investment agenda until August 2026. And these plans must comply with strict conditions and criteria. They must address challenges and priorities identified in the country-specific recommendations. And here is the link with the European semester, strengthen growth potential, job creation and economic, social and institutional resilience, and support the green and digital transition. This instrument is solidarity in action. Europeans teaming up to help each other with tangible real life projects across the union, improving the lives of all Europeans, lifting real GDP levels by over two percentage points points of GDP by 2024, with up to 2 million new jobs by 2022. And with the positive impact on lower income countries, creating positive spillover effects for higher income countries by increasing demand for their exports. And how does the recovery and resilience facility work? Well, the Commission is currently having very intense discussions on the draft plans. Final plans can be submitted once the facility is legally enforced, which is expected very soon uh, on the 18th of February and up to 30th of April. And the Commission will be able to disperse the funds once the own resources decision is ratified. This is the instrument to allow the Commission to borrow the funds on financial markets. And several countries have already ratified. I understand this is still in the making in Belgium. Importantly, the Commission proposal for an implementing decision by the Council will include a detailed assessment of the plans in a staff working document, which is to replace the country report this year. And I can already indicatively announce that this would also cover member states' progress towards the SDGs. So what are the key attention points? Uh, while we are making good progress, there is still a lot of work ahead and the time frame is very tight. It will be key to ensure that all plans present the right balance between investments and reforms. Transformative reforms, we've already heard it from Nikhil said, are an essential part of each plan to address country specific recommendations and to make investments more effective and ensure the impact of the plan is ultimately long lasting. The facility is also a performance-based instrument. Payments will be linked to performance on the basis of agreed milestones and targets. Effective delivery of the investments and reforms in the plan requires national ownership. As Maria has underlined, countries should engage in a comprehensive policy dialogue to prepare and implement a plan to onboard key stakeholders, such as social partners and civil society. Robust audit and control mechanisms must also be in place, given the large amounts involved, to avoid serious irregularities and no double EU funding of same costs is involved. Measures may, of course, also not crowd out private investment and must aim rather to mobilize private investments. And to help member states, the Commission has published extensive guidance on all the elements to be included in the plans. So we have to go back one slide. The plan must represent a coherent and balanced response to the economic and social situation of the member states, contributing appropriately to all six pillars of the facility, which you can see listed here. 
And to monitor the implementation of the plans, a scoreboard will be made operational by the end of this year with updates every two years. And what I wanted to highlight on this slide is that the six pillars of the facility appear to match up well with the six transformations concept to reach sustainable development developed by Professor Sachs, who is also present here today. And also the five transitions mentioned by Nikhil Set earlier. And the idea is also mentioned in the 2019 UN Global Sustainable Development Report, as Maria was saying. So, reforms and investments that support the climate transition should be prioritized. At least 37% of expenditure on investment and reforms in the plan should support climate objectives. And in addition, every individual investment and reform measure must respect the do, do no significant harm to the environment principle. The taxonomy regulation sets out six environmental objectives to which no significant harm should be done. And this is a key requirement for the Commission to green light the plan. It is there to avoid as much as possible potential negative green trade offs of reforms and investments. And the Commission will provide further guidance on this principle very soon. Member states should also demonstrate a high level of ambition to achieve the digital transition with their plans, with a minimum of 20% of digital expenditure. Multi country and cross border projects contribute to scaling up the European strategic digital and green capacities, and all member states are invited to include such projects in their plans. Member states are also invited to indicate how their plan will contribute to the 2025 EU wide ambitions in the European flagships, which you can see listed here. There are seven of them to address issues that are common to all member states that need significant investments and are needed for the green and digital transition. Recovery and resilience plans will be assessed against the 2019 and 2020 country specific recommendations for which no substantial progress has been made. And as you can see here, the 2019 and 2020 country specific recommendations to Belgium are structured around four main themes, each of which contributes to Belgium's delivery on the SDGs. You see here too that the Sustainable Development Solutions Network assessment of Belgium's challenges and priorities largely coincide with the assessment under the European semester. To conclude, sustainability is now clearly embedded in the European semester of economic governance. Two, the recovery and resilience facility is solidarity in action. It offers a historic opportunity for the EU and member states to kickstart economic repair and recovery in a sustainable way, accelerating the SDG delivery. One thing is clear, to bank on this opportunity, ensure it is a lasting success and improves the life and livelihood of every European with positive global spillover effects. Every level, will have to do its bit and team up governments, civil society, science and business, EU, EU institutions. And with solidarity comes responsibility. So what matters foremost now is that every member state takes full ownership of the instrument and the commission stands ready to work with member states to ensure the funds are put to their best possible use. I thank you for your attention and look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Vigla Nautz, for this uh, very focused presentation. 
uh, it gives a very clear overview of uh, the framework of the European uh, semester and recovery plan. So we hope, of course, for a positive vote uh, tomorrow uh, in the European Parliament. Um, thank you so much to be with us this uh, afternoon, uh, European time, uh, and hopefully to work together, uh, not only with uh, the CIFAL centers in Europe, but also with uh, the network of uh, the SDSN network in, in Europe. So thank you so much to be with us this uh, afternoon. And I'd like to give the floor um, to our uh, Belgian um, Federal Minister, State Secretary, I need to say for recovery, strategic investments and science uh, policy, Mr. Thomas Dermin. Bonjour, Monsieur Dermin. Uh, merci pour être chez nous cet après-midi. Uh, to talk about the specific Belgian uh, position towards this huge, I think maybe to say historic, European plan of recovery in the midst of COVID-19. Mr. Dermin, the floor is yours. Hello, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure to be with you this afternoon, and I'm very uh, uh, pleased to be here. Uh, thanks for uh, the organization. Um, I think it's a great opportunity to share uh, the SDG in practice and uh, echoing the presentation of uh, Mrs. Uh, Neutz. It's, um, it's a good opportunity to show a positive case of dialogue between the Commission and uh, a, member, a member state, in this case uh, Belgium, because I can confirm that the process is very uh, intensive these days as we have submitted our first, um, I mean, one part of a first draft on Friday. Um, and I want to thank all my uh, teammates and also the teammates of uh, one of my colleagues, Minister Zakia Katabi, who has been uh, working on uh, this uh, with us. Um, I want to also start by saying that um, the um, Commission and, and the European Union actually has, has really played an amazing role in the uh, preparation of the aftermath of the Corona crisis. I think that, um, as it has been often said, Europe, l'Europe se construit dans les crises. Uh, Europe is building itself through crisis, and the Corona crisis is another case. And I hope that we will, um, in the future, look at the Corona crisis as a moment where. Europe has actually stepped up uh, in a way uh, forward in its integration and, and the way um, the Commission is working with the Member State in order to find their way out of the crisis uh, by also investing in the reforms and the projects that are needed to um, basically uh, improve the long-term situation of the Member State is really uh, remarkable and as a true believer in the European integration process, I think we can be very happy of this. So that was the first uh, comment I wanted to make to the position. I will try to share my screen. Cool, excellent. So it's a, it's a great opportunity actually to share a few words on, on our plan in Belgium. Uh, I will first stress the need for uh, public investment in Belgium. Um, then give you a few highlights on, on what our uh, recovery plan for Belgium looks like. And basically you'll get a snapshot of the documents that uh, uh, the team at the commission uh, will uh, receive or has received um, in the last days. Um, and then actually we, together with the team of, of, of uh, Minister Katabi, we try to lay out how basically we want to put SDG at the core of the work we do with the uh, RRF uh, in Belgium. Um, so three things that are very important to us regarding the COVID-19 crisis. Um, so first, the magnitude um, has never been seen before. I mean, if you compare, this is the, the GDP uh, change uh, uh, quarter per quarter. And basically what you observe is that the order of magnitude of the crisis in Belgium, but it has been the same across uh, most of the, of the states uh, worldwide, has never seen before. What we observe also is that it has a huge impact on inequalities. Uh, what we observe in Belgium is that we have a positive shock on savings. 
the National Bank has released a report that basically is saying that at an aggregate level, uh, 24 billion of additional savings has been accumulated through the crisis. But actually, if you look at the distributional impact of, of, of this, it has a very different impact from decile to decile in terms of income distribution. And um, the most uh, vulnerable person actually are being increasingly vulnerable to the crisis, whereas the most well-off are uh, being increasingly uh, well off the crisis. So this is very, an important aspect of the crisis is the uh, uh, impact on the income distribution. And the third aspect, uh, which is very important is uh, that because it's not uh, what I would say a systemic uh, crisis in the sense that it has no uh, monetary or, or, or root, um, the um, actually the, the, the rebound effect that we might uh, expect is quite high. I mean, this, the last bar in the bar chart is the uh, GDP variation in uh, the third semester of 2020. And actually in Belgium in the third semester, so it was about the summer, we have released the economy. And what we have observed is actually that the, the GDP uh, has gone back to a very high uh, rebound uh, level. And so basically what we try to do um, with um, the government uh, is basically two things. In the short term, we try to protect as much as we can um, the um, econo social economic engine of the country, while at the same time, we are uh, preparing the recovery and resilience plan uh, that we are drafting together with um, the European Union. Um, next, please. Um, what uh, we really appreciate in the um, approach of the Commission is that actually uh, it seems that we have learned from the past and that we have learned that the best way to get out of a crisis, especially a crisis, a crisis of this nature, is actually to invest our way out of the crisis while combining with uh, structural reforms that are uh, long uh, needed. And this is a very interesting review um, by uh, the National Bank of Belgium, actually showing that if you do it the right way, the combination of smart public investment together with the reforms that are needed is one of the very good way to um, stimulate GDP, but also private consumption and private investment. Um, and that actually, if you do this in a, a period where the uh, economy is not going bad, not going well. The multiplier effect is 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 even bigger. Something that we have to keep in mind for those who don't know uh, very well the Belgian economy is that actually um, we have been lagging behind in terms of investment. If you compare Belgium to other um, uh, countries, uh, this graph shows you the uh, European average. Uh, the European um, public investment grade in comparison with the blue line, which is the AU27 uh, average. And actually, over the last 20 years, we have been um, under, in, under investing significantly in comparison with the um, AU average. And if some of you are living in Belgium, uh, you can uh, see that if you see the, the level of some of the uh, public infrastructure in, in Brussels or around the country. And um, what we um, see, and, 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 and we therefore really, um, I mean, support the approach of the Commission, is that we see the Corona crisis as basically a very specific momentum where we can revert that trend in terms of public investment. We have taken a very strong commitment in our government agreement. You know that Belgium has um, a new government since uh, October 2020. And we have a very strong commitment to go back to 4% of public investment by 2030 with an interim target of 3.5% by the end of 2024. Um, you know also maybe that Belgium is a very specific institutional system and that the regions, so Flanders, Wallonia and the region of Brussels have um, very um, strong competencies in terms of investment. So if we have to, to design um, a comprehensive investment plan, we have to do it um, together. And that's also something we um, appreciate the 
the stimulus of the Commission uh, in this uh, recovery and resilience plan is that it has really stressed that we should have one single coherent approach for Belgium and that we shouldn't do what we sometimes do in Belgium is having four different chapters, uh, which uh, each one corresponding to uh, one of the regions. So since the very beginning of the effort, uh, it takes a bit of time, but we try to work together to have one single comprehensive approach for Belgium, basically addressing uh, five uh, different uh, challenges that globally overlap very well with the ones that have been presented in uh, Mrs. Uh, Merit's presentation in terms of how do we build the infrastructure to meet the environmental um, uh, challenge and, and meet our uh, commitment to reach the Paris uh, agreements. How do we cope with the digital challenge, knowing that it will and it has impacted uh, the job market in Belgium and the type of, of trainings that we, that we need in this country. Um, the mobility challenge, you all know that Belgium is, uh, can be quite a mess in terms of uh, mobility and uh, some other cities also. So we need to uh, invest. It's a question of um, succeeding in the model shift, but it's also a question of raising the productivity um, in Belgium. Um, we know we have a very strong social system in, in Belgium. We can be uh, very proud of it and, and it has proved that it has worked during the Corona crisis, but we know that we have also a long term uh, challenge in terms of financial sustainability um, of the system, um, especially um, on the pension side. And that's why it's one of the area of the CSR of the Commission in Belgium and one of the key um, aspects of reform uh, in the next few years. And the fifth uh, challenge, which is um, very important for Belgium, is what we call the productivity challenge. Belgium has always been one of the most productive countries in the world. And that's the, the reason why um, we have the, the, the wealth estate that we have in Belgium. But over the last uh, decade, the uh, productivity gap between Belgium and other uh, neighboring states has been smaller and smaller. So we need to keep on investing to basically sustain this high productivity in Belgium. So what does our plan look like? Uh, that's the big question. So we have been working very intensively with, uh, um, with the regions in Belgium, within the federal government to uh, follow the timing of the commission. And that's also something very important actually, that in Belgium, sometimes it can take a lot of time to discuss and to agree in between uh, the different uh, levels in the Belgium institutional system and the fact that we have an external timing imposed by the Commission, which is very, very, very um, uh, rapid, it really helps us in Belgium to find agreement very fast. And if you look at what we have delivered uh, in terms of uh, agreements between regions, etc., uh, over the last uh, two months, it's, it's pretty remarkable uh, in Belgium. And it is partly due to the fact that the Commission is uh, imposing a very strong tempo on uh, the work uh, that we are uh, doing. So basically, we have submitted the first draft uh, with the project uh, last Friday. This uh, week or next week, we will submit the other 50% of the plan, which concerns the reforms and the structural reform that we uh, commit to and the idea is to use the next um, two or three months to exchange with the Commission, but also with the uh, Bureau Federal uh, du Plan, the Federal Plan Bureau, um, to uh, assess the impact of the plan and make sure that we prioritize the projects and the reforms based on their impact on social economic outcome, but also environmental uh, outcome. Um, what will you uh, find in our plan? So we um, uh, focus, of course, uh, on investment. That's one part of the story. Uh, productive investment related to the five challenges I have highlighted. We also have an ambitious uh, reform agenda that relates to the um, uh, CSR, so the country-specific recommendation within the European semester that uh, Mevrouw uh, Neutz uh, has uh, spoken about. Um, in Belgium, the good thing is that in the regions and at the federal level, we have had, I mean, we have re relatively new 
uh, governments. And so the CSR of 2019 actually were known at the time we were drafting the government agreements. So we already have in our government agreements part of um, uh, uh, reforms or some elements of the reforms that we need to do. What we need to do now is really details, um, really put details in the roadmap reforms that we that we need to do. And that's what we're going to work on with the team of the Commission in the next uh, few weeks. Um, as said before, we have uh, 5.9 billion uh, of grants uh, from the uh, recovery and resilience facility. What we have done so far is that we're working on 130% of this total amount in order to have a margin for adjustment um, based on the feedback we, we will receive from the Commission and from other external bodies. Uh, we try to work with big significant projects and to avoid that we have tons of very small projects. So we have uh, 89 investment projects with an average size of 87 uh, million uh, euro. And we try to reduce the number of components, the project types to uh, less than 20. Actually, we have reached uh, 19. Uh, just to give you a few examples um, of the projects and what are the type of projects that we will fund in terms of investment um, on the five uh, different axes. Uh, in terms of sustainability, uh, we will fund the backbone for hydrogen and uh, keep capture of CO2. We will work on a new island in the North Sea to connect the different uh, offshore uh, mills. Uh, we will invest heavily in the renovation of uh, public uh, buildings, uh, which are responsible for uh, a significant share of the CO2 emissions in Belgium. In terms of um, digital, um, we will invest heavily in digitization of uh, public services with a special focus actually on justice, who is lagging behind uh, in Belgium, uh, investing also in cybersecurity. And we will do that together with the um, uh, army and with other member states. Uh, mobility, it will be mostly uh, investment in our railway infrastructure for passengers, but also for uh, freight uh, transport, which is very uh, important. Also some project in terms of inclusiveness, uh, including uh, training and research. Uh, um, and then on uh, productivity, uh, we will have also a few uh, very important uh, projects uh, in the industry, also in the port of Antwerp. Uh, I know that some of you, including Peter Wolot, are from Antwerp, but uh, Antwerp is a very important entry door uh, to Belgium, but also to Europe. And there are some um, issues with the drug trafficking in Antwerp. So we will invest heavily in uh, preventing this uh, from happening. Very shortly to conclude, uh, who are we thinking of the link to um, SDGs? Um, Relance is not about uh, a back to normal shortcut. And we really try to build a new basis, both from the investment side uh, and, and, and also from the reform side. And, and we have a lot of taboos in, in policymaking in Belgium. And this is also a good opportunity for governments at the regional level, at the federal level, to address those um, uh, taboos. Um, yeah, if you go next, uh, Anton. Um, and honestly, we had a lot of discussion internally, but also with the regions on how should we um, report to the um, different projects and the different reforms. And we were confronted to the limits of the existing uh, KPIs, uh, whether it's employment, uh, whether it's uh, GDP. Uh, and so the toolkits and the framework of the SDG is, is very relevant to our work. And even before we actually uh, learned that the Commission was considering a reporting on the SDGs, um, we were considering the tool to actually have this kind of holistic approach on, on development, uh, which is uh, targeted with the development plan. Um, the current crisis, uh, and we are actively monitoring this within the government, is actually having a drastic impact on many of the SDGs. 
whether it's uh, impact on the outcomes in education, on inequalities, on health issues, on mental health, which is um, very uh, important these days. Um, and, and we will use the same um, framework actually to um, evaluate the policies that we will lead in the aftermath uh, of the crisis. Um, this is actually another way to put what uh, Ms. Uh, Nerds uh, has explained before. We have um, the uh, sustained SDGs, which are included in the country report that we receive from the Commission, which are translated in the country specific recommendations, which are basically the basis for the reforms that we will include in our resilience and recovery plan. So basically the SDGs through that channel are really at the core of what we do. And what we are doing right now, and I must say that it's quite an intensive job of my team together with the team of uh, uh, Mrs. Um, Zakia Katabi, is basically evaluating each investment project at the light of the 17 SDG to make sure that we have an exhaustive coverage of the SDG and the, we address the right ones where we need to have uh, an impact. So um, overall, and I would like to end my presentation here because I think I've, I'm already over time, but I mean, the work on the SDG is really at the core of what we do both on the investment side uh, and also via the CSR on the reform side. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, uh, Monsieur Dermin. This was such a, an interesting presentation with so much, uh, so many details on on how you've been thinking uh, through this process. I was also very happy to see the happiness report again. This idea of putting um, well-being at the center. Um, I know you have to go. Do you have a, a minute for one quick question? Yeah, for, yeah, for sure. So you've been, you've mentioned that there, the next few months you planned some exchanges with obviously the Commission, the Bureau of Federal Government. Are there any um, consultation processes uh, planned? Do you want, are, are you going to be uh, reaching out to academia, to civil society to consult on these plans? Yeah, so it's, you know, it's always a trade-off um, between um, speed and representativity uh, in your consultation process. Um, I'm really sad that we don't have uh, more time to do an exhaustive um, consultation process, uh, which requires a lot of time. But I do understand the reason why we don't have so much time is actually that in a recovery strategy, um, as Keynes used to put it, uh, time is of the essence. So basically you need to release the investment right in the aftermath of the crisis, otherwise the impact will be um, lower. Nevertheless, we will do a lot of consultation in the next um, uh, two, three months. Uh, so we will have the interaction with the commission. We will have the consultation with the uh, Bureau Federal du Plan, which is basically uh, the economic entity responsible for impact assessment in Belgium. We will have also an impact assessment on um, gender equality with uh, something we have, uh, Institut pour l'égalité entre les hommes uh, et les femmes. We will have an impact assessment on, um, on inequalities by um, a body called SPP Integration uh, Sociale. And we have also something in Belgium, which is very cool actually, which is Conseil Fédéral du Développement Durable. So Federal Council for Sustainable Development, which integrates many uh, NGOs uh, active in the environmental field, also youth association, uh, and they will be involved in basically uh, producing a report that will influence the government on the prioritization of projects going from 130% to 100%. And they will also submit a report on the uh, reforms that we uh, need to submit to the Commission. Thank you very much. Um, I think we're going to start moving to our panel. So I'm just going to introduce our panelists one by one and ask them to turn on their camera. Um, so Dirk uh, Franzire is the managing director of uh, VITO, the Flemish Institute for Technological Research. He's a member, this is a member organization of SDSN Belgium that provides scientific advice and technological innovations that facilitate the transition to a sustainable society. 
Mr. Franz Sayer is one of the main initiators between, uh, uh, behind GSTIC, the Global Sustainable Technological and Innovation Community. And in 2017, he was appointed as honorary professor of the KU Leuven. Um, we also have Eloise Baudin, uh, policy analyst at the Institute of European Environmental Policy, where she focuses specifically on the European semester, SDGs, trade and economy. Eloise holds a business degree and a master's degree uh, in political economy of Europe from the London School of Economics. And prior to joining IEEP, she was a trainee at the DG Environment of the European Commission. Um, we have also Anton, Anton uh, Muldermans, uh, counsel to the secretary, state secretary, um, Mr. Dermin, that we've just had uh, with us. He coordinates the working group on sustainability for the drafting process of the Belgium Recovery and Resilience Plan. And finally, we have Berlin Nutz that will be also joining us again. Um, Welcome everyone and thank you very much for joining us. Um, perhaps uh, I will start with a question to, uh, just a follow-up question to uh, Berli. Um, and I encourage all of our participants to ask uh, questions via the chat. Um, Berli, what are some of the key recommendations for Belgium relating to the SDGs? You showed our, our dashboard from the SDSN um, sustainable development report. And I, I just wanted to follow up, what would you say are key recommendations coming from the previous semester exercises? Exactly, this is the, the yes. slide. <laughs> if this is indeed uh, the, the slide that I was presenting uh, earlier. Um, uh, no, no uh, indeed, um, so delivering on, on these um, country-specific recommendations in, in the context of the European semester, uh, as I explained before, really means delivering on all SDGs. And, um, and as I will uh, explain here, but for Belgium, that this means uh, delivering on, on almost all SDGs too. Um, you see that, that the CSRs, so that's what we call them in, in the EU jargon, so country-specific uh, recommendations, are structured around four main themes public finance and sustainability, employment and training, green and digital transition, and business environment. And as I already highlighted, uh, the challenges and priorities identified largely correspond with the challenges highlighted in the 2020 report by SDSN and the EU Institute for EU Environmental Policy. So what are these uh, different uh, recommendations? So first of all, um, the first policy recommendation is, is really to ensure sound public finances. Sustainable growth requires a sound budget and deteriorating public finances in Belgium limit its fiscal space for public investment, which has, as Mr. Dermin has explained, remained low over a long period of time. The comp composition and uh, the efficiency of public spending could be improved. And this is where the so-called spending reviews uh, could be further institutionalized uh, and be an important lever to achieve that. By unlocking efficiency gains, they could generate savings without constraining growth. Fiscal frameworks also could play an important role in improving fiscal coordination between the levels of government and the sustainability of the pension system, as Mr. Dermin has also highlighted uh, in his presentation, is also an attention point. And implementing these recommendations would contribute to the delivery of SDGs 16 and 8. In the area of uh, employment and uh, education, I'm sorry, I just noticed that my video was not on. So here I am. I hope you can all see me again. Uh, in the area of uh, employment and education, uh, the council recommended uh, that Belgium uh, does uh, different things. So first of all, that it removes uh, disincentives to work, uh, that it ensures more active and more effect effective, sorry, activation uh, measures, 
uh, to make sure that more people uh, are at work, in particular for vulnerable groups. And also that uh, Belgium improves the performance and equity of the education and training system to make it digital and green transition proof. And this will also have a positive impact on the public finances. And policy priorities here uh, would include reducing the tax burden on labor and developing a skill strategy to promote lifelong learning and addressing skill shortages and mismatches. And implementing these recommendations in this particular area would set Belgium on its path to the delivery uh, of SDGs 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 8 and 10. Productive investments, uh, of course, uh, uh, as Ms. Oyamin has, has also highlighted, are very central uh, if you want to uh, have a swift recovery uh, and really establish uh, sustainably that path towards a sustainable green and digital economy. A clear and stable legal framework uh, to foster this transition is also very important uh, in this area. And there are four recommended focus areas of investment to Belgium. Energy transition and circular economy, sustainable mobility, ensuring the adequate digital infrastructure is in place uh, to enable the green and digital transition. And Belgium lags behind here in, in 5G and fiber deployment and research and innovation. And these investments will enable Belgium to achieve on a very large number uh, of SDGs. And finally, the path towards a more sustainable economy requires that a business environment is in place, which is really conducive to foster public and private investment. And key reform and investment recommendations here concern areas such as, you know, more thorough policy evaluation, coordination between different government levels, innovation, digitization of public services, lightening the administrative burden and removing barriers to competition and services. And so this is this is it for me. This is these are the recommendations under the 2019 and 2020 uh, recommendations to Belgium. Thank you very much. That was very useful. Um, uh, Dirk, perhaps uh, moving to you um, and thinking about these umbrella areas that both the Commission, uh, but then the government has just presented. What would you, what do you think are key projects that should be prioritized in these uh, recovery plan? Uh, you know the country very well, specifically the sustainable development um, environment. So what would you recommend? Well, I think there are uh, good points and, and things that I would personally have seen a little bit different, but which are maybe different, different to implement. First of all, it's good that um, if we spend money, we spend it on investment projects and we simply don't spend it on increase of wages or, or, or other stuff. Um, I think the investments are necessary. We will, should look for projects we have a uh, as much as possible a lasting effect on employability. Uh, you see in the plans of the Commission that there is a lot of attention for education, etc., which is which is good, which is proper. At the same time, you need, of course, need to have jobs which people can fill in. Um, because it's not only the, the fault of the fault between brackets, you know, the people that they don't find work. If there's no work, you can be as educated as you want. Uh, you won't, won't have the job. So you, you should look for in, in some of the investment projects that we've seen, or, or at least which are which we think are in, in the pipeline, or for short-term um, renovation of buildings, for instance. Uh, once it's renovated, it's renovated. And then the question is, what will be the effect? You can have an effect on uh, reduced CO2 emissions. Um, that's okay, but when I hear that a large part of the CO2 emissions would come from buildings. Again, that is not true. I keep repeating that it is not true. Uh, about half of the emissions in Belgium, at least in Flanders, are from industry, ETS. The other ones are non-ETS, can be 40, 60. And only one third of the non-ETS is attributable to buildings. I don't understand the fixation for buildings. 
And certainly with the plans which are in place, we will not reach the goals intended, the 80 to 90% reduction of the CO2 emissions for buildings. It is simply not the best way to spend money in this way. Um, sorry, um, but, but what you see is um, that um, there's a lot of mentioning, uh, I think properly, if you look at the SDGs, uh, they come from uh, the sustainability notion. So the social component should be in there and the social component should be in there almost at the same level as, as the others. So on a personal level, um, it's not a company, it's not the Vito's position, um, but on a personal level, what you see is that if there is an investment, uh, if there is a subsidy going to an industrial project, it will only be realized if that uh, company makes a profit because otherwise it will not pass the internal criteria for an investment from that company. If you look at the uh, efforts the, which are demanded from the private side, from the public, it's only a cost. If you have to invest and look at the, the present cost for uh, renovating your buildings, we are at the CO2 cost for uh, avoided emissions on the, on, the per, on, the, on the private side between 200 and 300 euro per ton CO2. It's on, on the industrial side, there was mentioning of, of an infrastructural uh, pipeline for hydrogen and CO2. First of all, I'm a very big favor of that in infrastructure, not to say, but it will, that CO2 capture will only happen if the companies who will co-invest, it will be a PPP, make a profit on their investment. Otherwise, it will not pass the decision level at their board. So here you have a situation where companies are will be making a profit from this entire transition that we are going through and that uh, civil society will have to pay. And from an SDG point of view, from an economic point of view, you can explain this. From an SDG point of view, it's very difficult to explain. I could give you some, some more examples I've written here on a whole, whole page. For instance, and that is a question of, of how do you structure a thing like that? Um, certainly, if you compare this sort of investment package to investment package, if I, if I look to other countries, like for instance, in China, um, there's a lot of mentioning of, of, for instance, sustainable mobility. Here, they simply mean get people onto, and I've put it again between brackets, public transportation. But the public transportation is still defined in the way we know public transportation as it is today. But you could come up, certainly if you look at the digital transformation, if you look at the digital infrastructure, we have another type of public information, public transportation, where the public, where you actually serve with the 5G, where you actually serve each car. And you don't have to wait for very advanced cars to actually work together as soon as you have your 5G in place. But that involves a different type of steering by government. And there you see a very large role in the commission because Belgium cannot do it alone because we are not on an island. UK could do it, but we can't. I mean, because we constantly have to have traffic from Germany, France, etc. But on an EU level, which spans the continent, you can do it again. Mm -hmm. But it involves a different view on how these projects, these large infrastructural projects, can serve public goods. I'll, I'll keep it at that. Thank you very much. Very insightful comments. Um, I see that our, our um, final um, speaker has just joined us, um, Professor Sachs. I'm, I, we're still in the panel. I'm just going to ask a final question to our colleague, Eloise Baudin. Perfect. Uh, I want to. I want to hear. <laughs> so <laughs> wonderful. So, Eloise, you've you've done quite a bit of work, and you've worked with SDSN uh, in the question uh, at the uh, on the question of uh, monitoring progress uh, towards the SDGs, and in particular, how the semester process can really align itself with the SDGs. Um, there was a question in this in the chat specifically about how the Commission can measure progress on the SDG alignment and what kind of tools uh, and monitoring framework can the semester process use? Yes, okay, thank you. And thank you for the question and all the interesting uh, presentations before me. 
so indeed, we've we've done uh, some some research on the European semester and and met uh, with uh, different EU officials from the Commission. Well, already, and as we all know, there's been a lot of progress in the integration of SDGs in the European semester. So we're we're very glad with what has been done uh, in the past few years, and I think the COVID nineteen crisis showed how important it was to. Uh, look beyond the, the GDP indicator when we do a budget planning. Um, so at the AEP, we've we've done some research on the on the possibility to integrate new indicators in the semester process. Uh, and of course, uh, what we've heard back is that um, a lot of EU officials don't want to overburden the semester process. Um, but what we've seen is that after the 2008 crisis, a lot of growth indicators, a lot of indicators were added to the process, and, and perhaps some of those could be replaced with more sustainable, sustainable economy-focused indicators. So we published a paper on that topic uh, where we propose eight dimensions of a sustainable economy. Uh, so that's, that's one way, of course, uh, to look at this. And, uh, and then there is also the possibility to, to have a civil society shadow reporting on the side of the semester. That could be a good way to, to increase the member states' accountability uh, on, on this topic. Um, and uh, then I had one last point. Yeah, no. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Thank you very much. Yeah. Anton, I see that you're leaving. Can I ask you just a final question? Really sorry, but um, there was a question in the chat about uh, whether the the should do the, the do no harm principle should also apply externally. So that would be outside of, of Belgium. Uh, at SDSN, we're we're very thoroughly thinking through the question of spillover effects, specifically for European countries where achieving the SDGs should not uh, involve harming the opportunities of other countries to achieve uh, the SDGs. I don't know if this is something that you've been thinking through in the first stage of drafting this plan or if it's something that you have in the, in the pipeline for the, this 50% that is left. Well, most certainly in this process, um, one of our roles was, of course, to um, to lay the context and also educate all involved um, ministries and government levels about the structure of the uh, RRF. And so we've been giving trainings and we've been trained first by the Commission on not only what are the CSRs, but also the expectations and the goal sets. And so the do no significant harm um, principle um, has been shared quite widely. And so uh, we think that a first filter has been applied. And so um, uh, our project should, in general, uh, respect that. But we are, of course, uh, very uh, much looking forward to the feedback from the Commission with all their expertise. And so we think that our um, draft report that we have now, we are very open to receive feedback on it and to still uh, improve it and fine tune it taking into account uh, remarks on this principle. And of course, also, I mean, it, it, it would be strange if it was not a shared uh, objective to avoid negative spillover effects um, to, uh, to other countries. So um, to the extent where we would uh, be uh, not aligned on that, uh, we still have three months in front of us to work hard on it and, uh, and still improve the plan. Thank you very much. Well, I think at this stage, uh, I, I will just thank everyone for joining us today. It, was be, it has been a fascinating conversation, really interesting to hear about the process that the, the, the Belgian government has uh, gone through and, and the recommendations from the Commission. Thank you very much, really for a very thorough uh, presentation on these. Um, I'll give the floor now to Professor Jeffrey Sachs that I think uh, needs very little introduction, but still obviously he's the president of the SDSN uh, and the university professor at Columbia University. He serves as the director of the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University, where he holds the rank of university professor. Um, he's an SDG advocate for UN Secretary General uh, Antonio Guterres. Uh, Jeff, over to you. Uh, Maria, I'm, I'm going to pass it back to you uh, because uh, I joined late, uh, uh, having been on a, a number of uh, UN uh, calls this morning. And I'd love to uh, hear what are the main issues uh, that came up. So I, how can I be most helpful uh, in, 
in, in the context of uh, the Belgian SDSN. And I want to thank uh, all my colleagues uh, in uh, SDSN Belgium for uh, your leadership and participation, but I'd like to be helpful. So I don't want to give you a, a boring, repetitive talk. I'd like to know what, uh, what, what, uh, what should I focus on and how can I help? So Jeff, um... SDSN Belgium has taken the baton uh, from SDSN, an idea that we had, uh, I believe, two months ago, where we said it would be very useful to have public seminars to discuss the recovery and resilience plans uh, openly uh, with members of the commission that can, that can provide specific insights for the country. So this has been the, the seminar of today. Um, I, I will ask Peter whether he has specific questions, but the main topic uh, has been what, what is the, why should we align the recovery and resilience plans to the SDGs? Um, and then how? So what are some of the key transformations that countries need to uh, consider? And then specifically for Belgium, what are some of the key recommendations that the European Commission has issued throughout the previous semester processes? Um, so recommendations for reform, but then also we've uh, we've seen our uh, sustainable development report and the dashboard for Belgium shown several times to highlight what are some of the challenges that um, Belgium has with specific goals, such as, for example, sustainable uh, consumption and production, yep. climate action, and so. Um, Peter. I think, uh, Jeff, it would be very useful to hear from you in terms of uh, your thoughts about why uh, it's so crucial to align uh, the recovery to the SDGs and how what, what kind of uh, specific items um, countries need to bear in mind when doing so. But I also want to uh, give Peter the opportunity to ask any other specific question from SDSM Belgium that he may have. Great. Thanks a lot. Hi, Peter. Hello, hello, uh, Jeff. Uh, no extra questions. Um, so indeed, like uh, Maria said, uh, it's all about that huge package of uh, recovery at the European level and how we can work together so that this package is as much in line with the SDGs as possible. And that was my introduction. How SDG proof is this EU recovery plan, uh, how SDG proof are the plans of the uh, EU member states, and why is it important that they will be in line with the SDG agenda? Excellent, uh, Peter, thank you very much. Uh, I, I think that the SDG agenda, and with that, of course, I include the agenda of the Paris Climate Agreement and the uh, Convention on Biodiversity, uh, to be most helpful because they give us a sight on the horizon of where we're heading. Uh, they help us to think longer term. Our societies are not very good at thinking long term. Uh, Europe is a bit better than the United States. We think, uh, now we think day to day, uh, during Trump we thought tweet to tweet. Uh, we had no uh, long term orientation whatsoever. Uh, everything was uh, improv, and uh, of course we were flailing about. And I regard the SDGs mainly as the opportunity to take a longer term view. And in that regard, I personally believe that the European Green Deal is exemplary uh, in this. Uh, I'm a huge fan and if we do, and I'll put in quotation marks, nothing more than achieve the European Green Deal, I think uh, you're making history uh, and deeply influencing the whole world. What I like about the European Green Deal is uh, three things. The time horizon, which is let's go deep and uh, do this to mid-century, for example, decarbonization. Let's be broad-based so that the Green Deal is about, uh, about the decarb, uh, it's about farm to fork, it's about circular economy, uh, it's gotta 
strong digital component to it. And I think that that is uh, really uh, extremely important. And the third thing I like about it is that it's very bureaucratic. And uh, I say that in the sense of Weberian bureaucracy. So Max Weber's sense of rational bureaucracy. Uh, maybe because I've lived through complete irrationality, even uh, psychopathy for the last four years. It's nice to see some clarity that these are the processes, these are the steps, this is what we're going to do. Of course, life should not be only bureaucracy, but without bureaucracy, there's uh, no order also. So I actually like the fact that there are a number of pretty complex systems that are being engaged for the European Green Deal. But now the question is making it work, uh, actually uh, making the investments that are needed to achieve success. And that is both an analytical challenge and a financial challenge and a practical political challenge. And it's by no means uh, easy to do because it's not easy to make public policy with a time horizon of 30 years to stick with it and in our very confused world uh, to actually move forward. And because Europe is 27 and not eye to eye and in very different historical contexts and different issues of development and some have coal and others don't have coal and uh, all the rest, uh, bringing everybody along is obviously a, a major challenge. But I also like the fact that when Europe does this, it will inspire all the rest of the world to do it. Because I go everywhere in the world and say, Europe has a green deal, why don't you? So I'm trying to get ASEAN to make an ASEAN green deal. Uh, we're meeting with the ministers of uh, energy in Latin America to talk about a Latin American green deal. The African Union is interested, of course, in an African Union green deal. The United States is back uh, from insanity, uh, and uh, President Biden is uh, committed to decarbonization by 2050. We're back in the Paris Climate Agreement, thank you. Uh, I just saw today we're back in the Human Rights Council. That's a huge uh, plus also. So lots of good things are happening. And uh, Europe, I think, is playing an extremely important role in this. So I would turn the question back, how do we make the European Green Deal really work? And is there clarity of the process? Is there a is there realistic assessments of the investment priorities? Is there enough European-wide coordination for success? Because with Europe, uh, there are European-wide goals, but then typically national implementation. That was not good for COVID. Uh, you know, you can't have a tightly packed uh, population moving constantly within Europe and control it in 27 separate nations. And everybody has learned that, but the European Union did not have an EU-wide mandate or strategy uh, or plans. And Europe has suffered a lot as a result of that excessive decentralization in, in responding to, to COVID, at least in my understanding of it. So when it comes to energy, for example, what is the status of making a proper European-wide zero carbon integrated energy system and energy market? That's the goal, not 27 separate energy policies, but one energy policy for Europe as a whole to have an integrated, low cost, efficient, uh, robust, resilient, uh, energy, zero carbon energy system. What is the prospect of, for example, electrification of freight uh, within Europe? To what extent is that being coordinated? Uh, what about shipping 
in Europe, which is a big deal, a major industry for Belgium, for uh, others. And to what extent is that being coordinated? What about for Airbus uh, and the strategy for Airbus? Uh, fortunately, there are only a handful of civil aviation, long haul passenger uh, uh, manufacturers, really only two for, for long haul, Boeing and, and uh, Airbus. Is there a suitable strategy? What about the power grid? Uh, what about the ideas uh, that have been around for at least 20 years now for connecting with North Africa uh, and the Eastern Mediterranean? How does Nord Stream 2 relate to decarbonization? Uh, does this project still make sense in the context of uh, a decarbonization strategy? So these are areas where I would like to read the definitive analysis by SDSN members and say, here's what works, here's what doesn't work, here's what can be left to nations, here's what needs to be done at the union-wide level, let's get realistic, we're gonna need this many trillion dollars of investment, here's what EIB can do, here's what the uh, European budget can do, here's what private companies can do. Um, that, to my mind, would help enormously. The farm to fork issues are equally as complex uh, and uh, even more complex in a way because while there's really only one energy system, there are dozens of uh, farm systems. Um, to what extent do we know what we're doing in uh, food sustainability, healthier diets, uh, regulation of the food industry to ensure healthy foods uh, and the relations to land use change. There's also the very big issue of Europe's international uh, dimensions on this. Uh, Europe has the correct idea of putting border carbon taxes on. I think that's opened a lot of eyes and I think it's a very good idea. Uh, and I think it will become a general tool uh, because I expect the US to do the same and, and others to do the same. And I think that that will help enforce decarbonization. But there's another aspect, which is long, long distance supply chain management. And I'm probably out of date on the discussion in the European Parliament on a supply chain law to ensure sustainability of uh, global supply chains. But this is very important for Europe because Europe's a huge demander of primary commodities from the rest of the world. And so ensuring not only farm to fork sustainability within Europe, but also uh, in Europe's uh, agricultural global demand would make a huge difference. I know Brazil is you know, profoundly aware of whether Europe will uh, help to enforce the sustainability of the Amazon or not in buying products from Brazil? And I very much hope the answer is yes. Uh, two more areas quickly to mention. Uh, one is the circular economy. I think Europe's discussions about circular economy are the most advanced in the world. Uh, it's just not a concept in most places, even though it's crucial, uh, but it's not an organized policy concept in most places, but it is very much in Europe. Waste recycling, uh, of course, plastics, pollution, and so forth. So I think what Europe does in the uh, circular economy side will be um, really important, not only within Europe, but also as a, uh, role, as a role model for the rest of the world. And then the final uh, area that I would uh, mention is the digital. Uh, Europe is absolutely in the lead on thinking about digital privacy, digital rights, digital monopoly, all very important. Um, I wish there were more European big players though, frankly, because right now Europe uh, basically is trying to regulate US 
uh, companies or Chinese companies, but I wish there were some European giants actually that were competing also with them uh, because I think it would be safer for the world if we weren't relying on three or four US companies in this sector. So you know, what kind of public policy in the digital domain is going to be very important for meeting the SDGs it, it, because it's so intimately connected with all of the other goals of, of sustainable development. So I would put that on the, uh, on the uh, uh, agenda as well. So for me, uh, Europe's really on the right track. It's already had a huge effect in spurring China Japan, Korea, and the United States to adopt similar kinds of programs. I really give Europe the credit of, for this. I mean, I've seen it directly, how influential uh, Europe uh, actually adopting the European Green Deal has been. Now we've got to make sure that that diplomacy stays very strong, that Europe implements all of this and insists that the partners do too. So th those are uh, just uh, some uh, opening thoughts or closing thoughts. <laughs> Thank you so much, um, Professor Sachs, dear Jeff, to be with us um, for hopefully a series of webinars on the importance of integrating the SDGs in all recovery plans uh, across the globe. So I've learned today that the recovery from COVID-19 provides a window of opportunity to accelerate the progress of the SDGs. It is important that we use the SDGs as a framework for the recovery plans and that we can join forces, multi-actor, interdisciplinary, intercultural, interreligious, to build towards a more sustainable world. I want to thank all guest speakers, panelists, participants, uh, we are so glad that we could reach more than um, uh, participants from more than 100 countries across the world for this webinar. So this is a, a new milestone also for SDSN Europe, Belgium and the CIFAL network in Europe and Flanders. So thank you so much to be with us here today. And I'd like to end with a very short poem because maybe one of the missing links in the agenda 2030 is arts. Uh, when we do some lectures and uh, trainings with artistic groups, they say, where are we in the text? Where are we in the agenda 2030? Where is the importance of arts and culture in the agenda? And therefore I want to close this webinar with a very short poem of Rupi Kaur. This is the recipe of life, said my mother, as she held me in her arms as I wept. Think of those flowers you plant in the garden each year. They will teach you that people too must wilt, fall, root, rise in order to bloom. Hopefully that the SDGs may bloom and flourish in Europe, in each of the member state countries and across the world. Thank you so much. Have a nice morning, evening, afternoon, and hopefully to see you again. For more information, join us on the websites of SDSN global SDS and Europe and the member states and of UNITAR, CIFAR Flanders and our colleagues of CIFAR Global Network. Thank you so much and hopefully to see you back. <laughs>